I'm in the shadow class. Which means I don't have to read it. But I am trying to read some of it. I've read a couple of the essays. I've got several of those. myself. My name is Wiley Cash. I am the Executive Director of Literary Arts here at UNC Asheville. And what that means is that I do a lot of things like this. I host literary events. I contribute literary offerings uh, here at the university, specifically with the hope of connecting to the community. And I'm so happy that you all came out tonight. It's really wonderful to see this many people um, in this room. And I want to thank Catherine Frank and the folks at Ali for making this space available to us and for being such good partners in this venture. This is, I think this is the third full year we've done Common Word. We're in the, the, the second half of the third full year. And every year uh, it gets more interesting and, and more involved and, and we get more support from folks like y'all. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I also teach here at the university. I teach uh, creative writing. I teach a fiction writing workshop and I teach uh, American literature and I'm teaching two classes this semester. And I've got a couple of students out there from my, my American Lit class, which is, which is thrilling, and I certainly appreciate them supporting me. And I'm just going to imagine that all of the other students in my classes are watching on the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> At least I hope they are, because I've written down the names of the ones who are here. <laughs> I want to announce a couple of events that we've got upcoming. Um, and I, I want to remind you, we started at seven last semester, and we're going to be starting at six this semester for these events, just because it's winter. It's dark kind of early. It's cold. I know some of you start like start to you know tip it up at about seven thirty, so you can get home and do that. We don't want to keep you here when you, when the shakes set in. I know, I know, I know. In terms of other literary events we've got coming, one I'm really excited about is Natalie Bazile. She'll be on campus Wednesday, March fifteenth over in the Blue Ridge Room in the Highsmith Center. Uh, Natalie wrote the novel Queen Sugar that was on the Oprah Network for several seasons. Uh, it was a television show. She also edited the anthology We Are Each Other's Harvest, uh, which is a wonderful book, a nonfiction book, about black farming and, and black rural life. Just a really, really beautiful book. The photography is beautiful, the writing is beautiful, and Natalie is a wonderful speaker and a really, really cool person. So she'll be here 7 p.m. Wednesday, March 15th in the Blue Ridge Room over in the Highsmith Center. We've got two more events after tonight. I hope you'll come to those that you're not just gonna throw in the towel. Um, I also forgot to mention that we're starting at six because I'm going till nine, 9.30 tonight. Um, we've got two events upcoming. On Monday, uh, March 18th, Professor Mark Gibney will be speaking. He is in our political science department here he is one of the foremost authorities in the world on political terror, political violence. He'll be talking about those things, both in reference to 1898 in Wilmington, but also political violence uh, around the globe and how it manifests itself um, in politics and culture and certainly in history. And then the last event of our series is Monday, April 8th. I'll be in conversation with author David Zacchino, who won the Pulitzer Prize for Wilmington's Lie in 2021. He won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for nonfiction for this book. Get my, get my, get my rap going there. I can't figure out what I'm pointing at. There's, there's David's handsome face right there. And, and that is a copy of the book. It's Um, group, so I'm, I'm really thrilled that David's going to join us. So tonight, if you saw the title, um, 
of my talk tonight, you saw that it was titled, Who's Afraid of Charles Chestnut? And because you were asking the question, I went ahead and put it in, Who's Charles Chestnut? <laughs> when I was doing my master's work at, at UNC Greensboro, it was the fall of 2000. This would have been, uh, this class would have happened in the spring of 2001. And there was a class being offered in North Carolina literature in the, in the, in the graduate English department. And I thought, well, that can't be too hard. I'm from North Carolina. I like literature. And we're probably going to read all the great North Carolina writers, you know, Nicholas Sparks. Um, I was just hoping it was going to be all Nicholas Sparks. So I go to the bookstore and I find this is in the this is in the old days where you where you have to go to the bookstore and you walk around with your registration sheet and you look for the paper that matches the numbers on your sheet and you look at the text. And all of the texts were by this guy named Charles W. Chestnut. All of them. Like nine books by Charles W. Chestnut. And I thought, well, maybe I don't know North Carolina literature as well as I thought I did. And so the class was <clears throat> the literature of Charles Chestnut. And I suspect that my professor, who ended up directing part of my, uh, directing my thesis, I suspect she knew that if she had put the literature of Charles Chestnut, nobody would have registered. But the literature of North Carolina, people showed up. So she laid a trap for us. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about laying traps for people a little, bit, a little bit later on. But that professor's name was Sally Ann Ferguson. And uh, she was my, my graduate thesis director at, at UNC Greensboro. And if there's any chance that, that Dr. Ferguson is watching tonight on the live stream, uh, I'm going to dedicate this talk to her. Because if she hadn't tricked me, I might, my career might have been very different. Because Chestnut has made up a large portion of my career. But before I talk about Charles Chestnut, since we're talking about Wilmington tonight, I want to talk about Y'all going to Wilmington with me. We are planning a trip March 15th through 17th. You might have, might have heard of Asheville Ideas Fest. We are in our third year here on the campus and in the community with Asheville Ideas Fest after two really successful years, two sellout years. Well, we're gonna take Asheville Ideas Fest on the road. which is the focus of Wilmington's Lie. We are going to have uh, discussions and lectures about America's uh, only carnivorous plants that are only native 50 miles around Wilmington, North Carolina. We are going to explore a centuries-old mansion after dark. We are going to have catered meals by beer-nominated chefs. We are going to drink exceptionally good booze. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, you can talk to me tonight after the event, and I'll get your email address. Uh, spots are very limited. We have about 20 spots, and I think they're a little more than halfway full. Uh, so I can, I can talk to you about that tonight. But I would be remiss if I didn't share that with you. So, who's afraid of Charles Chestnut? Who's Charles Chestnut? Age of 14. Chestnut was born in Cleveland, Ohio. We free black Americans in the South. And Chestnut's parents met on a wagon train out of North Carolina, headed for Ohio. And he was born in Cleveland. That when he was nine years old, he moved back home to Fayetteville, where his grandfather still was, his grandparents were still there, he still had a number of family members in the Cape Fear region, which we consider kind of Fayetteville South to Wilmington. Uh, we don't let Myrtle Beach be part of that. <laughs> but when he moved back to Wilmington at the age of nine, he started going to the Freedman School. These were schools set up after Reconstruction to educate black students, set up under the federal government. The school he went to was called the Howard School. So Chestnut during the day would go to the Howard School where he would study Greek and Latin 
and read classics. He also did this in his spare time. He was an avid journal keeper. He knew about the power of journals after reading Benjamin Franklin's journal. If anybody's read Benjamin Franklin's journal, uh, The Self-Made Man, which Chestnut certainly held himself out to be. If we read The Great Gatsby, Jay Gatsby also keeps a journal very similar to Benjamin Franklin, and we all know that Jay Gatsby is also a self-made man. But after school, Chestnut would do something very important. After studying Latin, and Greek, and the classics, and Nicholas Sparks, <laughs> he would go to his father's store. His father owned a general store. He was the black owner of a general store that served primarily black customers. And what happens at general stores? We've got to think it's 1872, especially. What are general stores good for? Well, you go there to get all of your stuff. I used to live in a town in West Virginia that had a general store. You could go and drop off your dry cleaning and get a sandwich and buy one nail <laughs> or one cigarette. One time my wife went in for batteries and they said, how many do you need? And just opened a pack and just gave her a battery for like a, a nickel. But at these general stores, they were not only centers of commerce, they were centers of communication. They were centers of entertainment. They were places where people would go to share stories, to share reports, to share deaths, to share weddings, to share news of bad tidings, maybe things like Ku Klux Klan activity in the neighborhood or in the community. That would certainly be shared at a general store like the one that Chestnut's father owned. What would also happen in general stores is storytelling. Lots and lots of storytelling. And so during the day, Chestnut would go to the Howard School, he'd learn his Latin, learn his Greek, do all of those very academic things that we do at places like UNC Asheville. And then after school, he would go and he would hang out at the store. And he has this incredible balance of high Western learning right? European cultural learning, combined with the oral narratives of the Deep South, especially the Deep South in black southern communities. So he's learning these tales that have traveled in many instances across the Atlantic Ocean. And he's taking all of this in. By the age of 14, which is how old he is in this photograph that I'm showing you, Chestnut was a pupil teacher. He was taking responsibility for being one of the teachers at the Howard School, still working in his father's store. By the age of 22, he was the principal of the Howard School. We also know at some point, I believe when he was 16, he traveled to Mecklenburg County and taught at a school on his own without his parents. This is Chestnut around the age of 22. And this is a really important quote. the power that fiction had over him. Also, he understood the power of story. So in his journal, on this date, May 29, 1880, Charles Chestnut writes, if I do write, I shall write for a
when I was 22 it was like, uh, 1 p.m. Made some bad mistakes last night. <laughs> but if we look at this, if we look at this quote specifically, let's look at why he's writing. Let's look at what's at the core of his high holy purpose. It's not so much to elevate what he refers to as the colored people. It's to elevate the whites. It's not to present black Americans in a good light or a better light. It's to present the truth of the experience and hope that white readers pay attention. So he is setting out at the age of 22 as a principal, dreaming of being a writer who affects change by telling the stories that he knows, the stories that he grew up seeing, the stories that he grew up hearing. Stories of the color line, stories of conjure, stories of the horrors of slavery, stories of the horrors of reconstruction. He writes about all of these things. He married uh, a teacher from the school. Her name was Susan Perry. They married in 1878. They would eventually have four children, three of them um, women and chestnut. It was very important to him that all of his daughters attended college, which was relatively uncommon, as you can imagine, at the time. They moved to New York City. He wanted to be a reporter. Thought that was the surest route to presenting the, the horrors of, of race prejudice in America. They lived in New York City for six months. Couldn't cut it. It's too much, too hard. The country boy went to New York City and city packing. So they moved to Cleveland not long after that. And in Cleveland, Chestnut, incredibly, an incredibly practical person, said, well, I can chase this dream while having children, or I can pursue a vocation and chase my dream in my spare time. So he studied law, passed the bar exam in Ohio, with the highest marks in his bar exam class. But because he identified as a black man, and he probably could have passed for white, but he chose not to. Because he identified as a black man, he couldn't find work as an attorney. So he taught himself shorthand. And just like he had taught himself all of those things back at the Howard School, and he opened a stenography business, and that's what he would do for the rest of his life. Off and on for the rest of his life, he would be a court reporter. But at the same time, he kept writing. He kept creating stories. He kept writing short stories. And the short stories he wrote were usually about one of two things, black life in the American South, or life on the color line in places like Cleveland, Ohio. And what is the color line? The color line is the demarcation between black folks and white folks. But what about the people who live on the color line? The people who can move fluidly back and forth? In my class uh, this week, my American Literary Traditions class, we talked about W.E.B. Du Bois' idea of double consciousness, which uh, he says is something specific to black Americans, that you always see yourself as a black American. Two ideals in one body. You can never wholly be just one thing without being the other. So now let's imagine someone like Charles Chestnut and those questions. What are you? Who are you? Do you belong here? At one point in his journals as a young man, writing about his color, his skin color, he says, I am neither fish, flesh, nor fowl. I fit in nowhere. I fit in nowhere. And so his color line of literature was about people who felt that they fit in nowhere, and also about the dangers of trying to fit into places where you might not really belong. But he started writing tales. Dialect tales especially. And he was writing in the fashion of the time. Let's keep in mind that Chestnut was incredibly pragmatic. He was incredibly rational. So what did it mean to write in the fashion of the time? What did it mean to say, hey, I'm a black writer, and I want to write black stories. And so if I'm going to write in the fashion of the time, then I have to do things that are already out there getting the attention of the readership and of the literary industry, and it's tales like Uncle Remus.
in Georgia, where he grew up on a plantation. And so he creates this old, happy, former slave named Uncle Remus. And Uncle Remus entertains the young white boy of the plantation with tales of talking animals, and conjure, and, and magic. And Uncle Remus is always happy to bend the young man's ear. And he perhaps loves the people who owned him. He is dedicated, and he is honest, and he is childlike. This is a still from the Disney movie Song of the South. Some of you might be members of Disney+. Plus. Cancel. One of my buddies is a, is a black comedian in Wilmington named Wills Maxwell. And he says, they didn't put Song of the South in the vault. They put it in the crypt below the vault. <laughs> they, they, they covered it in concrete and put it in the crypt below the vault. But this was what was popular at the time. These tales, these, these dialect tales. So let's think about why. This is the years after the Civil War. For the first time, Americans, because of the war, are traveling. People from Pennsylvania, men especially, obviously, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, are going down into the Deep South, in Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, and they're coming home and they're telling their parents, you'll never believe what they put in gumbo. Have you ever had a prelude? you never believe what Mardi Gras is. you never believe what blues music sounds like. You'll never believe how these people talk or how they live or what their houses look like. And people in northern communities, Philadelphia, Boston, New York City, are fascinated. And so we see the rise of something called the local color movement, which birthed writers you might have heard of like Mark Twain. Mark Twain wrote the local color craze in the years after the Civil War because there was such an infatuation with lands that were undiscovered. And the South's always been the great undiscovered land. It's always been the part of the country that's felt mythological. It's also been the part of the country that's been the safest to make, make fun of for that very reason. But slowly with westward expansion, we have lo local color writers from out west. Uh, Frank Norris, uh, Bret Hart, um, and they, they are sending back short stories from places like San Francisco and mining communities and uh, places in, in Washington and Oregon. So local color is really, really popular in Chestnut recognizes that, and he acknowledges that. And so he starts writing stories. And so one of the first stories that he publishes is called The Gooper Grapevine. And he published it in the Atlantic Monthly, The Atlantic, which is still one of the most esteemed magazines in the country. He published The Gooper Grapevine in 1887. And before I tell you what The Gooper Grapevine is about, I want to lay out local color for you just a little bit. I mentioned Mark Twain. We also have Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was a poet. We have Kate Chopin, if you've read her novel, The Awakening, it's set in Louisiana. Um, you know, it's uh, the, the craze at the time. But one of the tenets of local color that made it so interesting, one of the, I guess, themes or structures, is it's always a tale of an outsider going to the inside, right? So the leaping frog of Calaveras County. <laughs> An outsider goes to the inside. Because if the insider is on the inside, the insider is not going to remark on the cuisine, the dress, the accents, because the insider is inoculated against the shock of those things. So the outsider, the reporter, the real estate developer, the record producer, the preacher, has to go to the inside. And almost always, the outsider goes to the inside to take something, whether it be culture, a natural resource, an idea, music, almost every time. So Chestnut recognized that as well. So he writes the Grouper Grapevine. And the Grouper Grapevine is a, is a story that's set up as this. There is a white couple from Ohio, and they have purchased a plantation in North Carolina. And it's after the war, and they are so excited to move down to their plantation. And when they get there, 
they discover that a formerly enslaved man, an older man, is living on the plantation. His name's, he introduces himself as Uncle Julius. And he served what he refers to as Master McDougal for many, many years. And I was, I was born and raised here, and I, I sure hope y'all don't make me leave. And he ingratiates himself, he lowers himself, and they find him very charming. Very charming. He's a, I think they call him a relic of the old Seth. And then one day, they decide that they are going to tear up a grapevine on the property. Because they want to do some building, they want to do some planting, they want to change the, the lay of the land. And they tell Uncle Julius, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna tear up this grapevine. And get rid of it, get rid of this uh, you know, orchard or however, whatever you would call it, vineyard, whatever you would refer to it as. And Uncle Julius says, mm, I don't know if I'd do that. Well, yeah, I guess you can. I don't know. And the wife says, what is it, Uncle Julius? What, what are you not telling us? And Uncle Julius says, well, years ago, that, that, group, that great vine was cursed by a conjure woman who lived here. And... Uh, she made it so if you, if you ate from the fruit of that, that grapevine, you would get sick. And she did that because this enslaved man uh, would be sold. And, uh, she, you know, he, he ate it. I'm sorry, he, he ate it after it was poisoned. And um, I just can't tell you the rest of Uncle Julius tells what happened. Well, after the conjure woman po po uh, poisoned this grapevine, in the wintertime, the enslaved man who'd eaten the grapes would get real sick. And he would wither, and he would be near death. And then come spring, he would start to be healthy again. And his hair would grow, and his hair would begin to look like grapes. And then in the fall, he would start to wither, and he would get sick. And when winter came, he would almost die, and that's how his life carried on. And Master McDougal, you know, he was a smart man, so what he would always do in the summertime, he'd sell that enslaved man and get high dollar for him. Come winter, he'd go out back to the plantation he sold that man to and say, you're not taking care of this guy. Let me buy him back from you for a rock bottom price. Then the next summer, when the man was feeling healthy again, he'd sell him to a different plantation. And when he would get sick in the winter, he'd buy him back for a rock bottom price. And the wife says, that's a horrifying story. That humans can be, can be sold like that. Can be, can be moved like that, to manipulate price like that. Not to mention that the great arbor has been poisoned. Maybe we'll just leave that where it is. We'll just leave that, that grape arbor where it is. This is a, a terrible business. And then by the end of the story, the, the narrator, the man, the husband, learns that Uncle Julius is using that grapevine to make wine. He's selling it. <laughs> So what's going on in this story? What is Uncle Julius doing? What he is doing is he is exercising his agency with the only thing he has. <coughs> Cultural memory and storytelling. When Charles Chestnut was sitting on the porch at his father's store, one of the tales that he was surely hearing were the trickster tales. The trickster tales of rabbit that came over from Africa. And many cultures have a trickster tale. In Native American trickster stories, sometimes it's rabbit, sometimes it's coyote, sometimes it's spider. In African tales, sometimes it's snake. Uh, here in Appalachia, trickster's name is Jack. Jack tales. So many cultures have these tales. We're the smallest, least significant, least powerful, most impoverished is able to outsmart the people with all the money, all the power, and all the stuff that the little person needs. So let's go back to Chestnut's high holy purpose. He wants to affect change. He wants to reach the sentiments of white readers. So he's showing how intelligent Uncle Julius is, but he's also showing the horrors of slavery in the same story. And he's also making a buck. And he's also keeping up with the current of the time. So these trickster tales made up his first collection, The Conjure Woman. All of these tales involve Uncle Julius outsmarting 
this white couple who has come to own the plantation. And it's a Uh, a man who was turned into a tree. His, his, his lover was the conjure woman, and she turned him into a tree so he wouldn't be sold. And then one, and, and, and at night she would turn him back into a man and they would love each other. And in the morning she would turn him back into a tree. And then one day the tree was cut down and it was taken to the sawmill. And you could hear Sandy screaming as his body in the form of the tree went through the saw blades. And that wood was used to build the schoolhouse. And that's why you can't tear it down. And that's why you can't use that lumber to make your kitchen. And by the way, Uncle Julius is hosting poker games there. <laughs> Drinking the wine, exactly. Good call out. Drinking the wine that he made. So Chestnut published a bunch of these stories. And in 1899, he published the book, The Conjure Woman, with Houghton Mifflin. He published The Wife of His Youth, which were color line stories, most of them set in the North, uh, about people who had crossed the color line and passed for white, about their past coming and finding them in some ways, um, about people who did not know they were of mixed race and finding out, or maybe never finding out, but the readers certainly know. In 1900, he published a biography of Frederick Douglass. And also in 1900, he published his first novel called The House Behind the Cedars, which is set in a fictionalized fable. He was the best known black novelist in America at the time. He was the preeminent black writer in America. He and Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the poet, were the two best known black writers, two of the best known writers, certainly the local color writers, the realist writers in America. Chestnut, ever the businessman, ever the networker, ever the entrepreneur, was constantly reaching out to uh, mentors in the publishing industry. He reached out to people like George Washington Cable. He formed relationships with people like Walter Hines Page, who was an editor at Houghton Mifflin, or Doubleday. And he also reached out to William Dean Howells. This is the photograph of William Dean Howells. And he would bless these realist writers. He, would, he was a realist. Um, and what realism meant to someone like William Dean Howells is that your literature had to contain enough of, um, just enough to feel realistic, or just enough to feel real, in other words. And what it, realism was a response to the Civil War. Before, this, before realism, we have romanticism. Uh, you, think, you think the Brontes think about poets like Samuel Taylor Coleridge or William Wordsworth. Then we have Victorian literature. We think of people like Charles Dickens. <coughs> We're going to heal society. Realism com comes around and says, society is irrevocably broken. We just killed millions of people during a civil war. And literature responds with something called realism to bring in the reality of life in America. And that's what William Dean Howells preached. And that is a mentor that Charles Chestnut reached out to. And I thought I'd read a little bit of this letter when William Dean Howells reviewed three of Chestnut's publications in the Atlantic. Chestnut writes in May 1900, I want to thank you very cordially for your appreciative review of my books in the May Atlantic. It would have been pleasant coming from any source, and it has a very great value coming from you. I thank you especially for the few words of frank criticism where you call attention to lapses in style and to the occasional look and the reader's direction. I think I appreciate the force of these suggestions and shall be able to profit by them in the future. There would be little hope for me as a literary artist if I could not. So we see Chestnut kind of ingratiating himself with William Dean Howells just a little bit. 
At one point, Howells reached out to Chestnut when he was writing for Harper's Magazine, and he said, do you have a realistic book of black life in America? It would be of incredible interest, and I think Harper would, the, the publish, publishing company, I think Harper would publish it. I will hand deliver a realistic book about black life in America if you've got one. Stay tuned for that. So, in the years that Chestnut is publishing, something stunning happens in North Carolina and places across the South. The Fusionist Party is a party that springs up after Reconstruction. It's where formerly enslaved black Americans, men of course, because they could vote, free black men of color, and poor white men looked at one another and they said, you know what? We got an awful lot in common. We're working the land. We don't have as much money as the people in power. Let's begrudgingly form a political party and we'll call it the Fusionist Party. And in 1896, the Fusionist Party swept into power in North Carolina. North Carolina elected their first black congressman. His name was George Henry White from Bladen County. They elected a Fusionist governor in Russell. And places like Wilmington benefited greatly. But not everybody was happy about that. Not everybody was happy about that. And two people who were incredibly unhappy about that. On the left-hand side here, we have Josephus Daniels. white lower class. We've got to set things back to how they were. We have to take our state back. And once we take our state back, we'll take our country back. So how did they go about doing this? How did they convince voters to vote differently in 1898, or perhaps not vote at all, in statewide elections? Well, they ran really racially incendiary front page news in the News and Observer. They trumpeted white supremacy, like literally, we believe in white supremacy, we are fighting for white supremacy, support white supremacy. They falsified accusations of sexual violence concerning black men and white women. All of these things Josephus Daniels would later admit to. For the white folks who couldn't read, they found the power of political cartoons. And here you see Satan, who, as we know in the South, is a real person. <laughs> Just casual, devil works on families. <laughs> And my wife's Italian grandparents from Long Island were like, <laughs> but this devil is working on this man going to the ballot box. And the devil has the right. Josephus Daniels specifically hired a man named Norman Jeanette. Here's another one here. This is the fusion ballot box, and you see this demonized black man. of white supremacy, and you can see it here 
all over the state. This is a reprint from something the News and Observer put out in 2006 after North Carolina Think Oath Keepers, Jenny Thomas. Um, we see down in Wilmington in a speech in October 2014. idea of what Wilmington was like in 1898. I'm going to read very, very briefly from David Zacchino's book. Some of you have read it. If you haven't yet, I encourage you to do so before every single one of you comes to Wilmington with me March 15th through 17th. <laughs> in 1898, a field representative for the American Baptist Publication Society called Wilmington the freest town for a Negro in the country. Three of the city's ten aldermen were black as were 10 of 26 city policemen. There were black health inspectors, a black superintendent of streets, and far too many for white sensitivities, black postmasters and magistrates. White men could be arrested by black policemen, and in some cases were even obliged to appear before a black magistrate in court. Black merchants sold goods from stalls at the city's public market. Black men delivered mail to homes. At times of day when white women were unattended, they sorted mail beside white female mail clerks. A black barber served as county coroner. The county jailer was black, and the fact that he carried keys to the lockup infuriated whites. The county treasurer was a black man who distributed pay to the county's employees, forcing whites to accept money from black hands. In 1891, President Benjamin Harrison had appointed a black man, John C. Dancy, as federal customs collector for the Port of Wilmington. Dancy had replaced a white supremacist Democrat, and he drew an astonishing federal salary, $4,000 a year, or $1,000 more than the governor himself made. Wilmington was a thriving black town. It was a town where Reconstruction was working, at the time, it was the largest and most prosperous city in North Carolina. So we see the cartoons, and then we see the reality. We read the headlines, and then we know the truth. And those two things, in this instance, are not aligned. But how do you go out and tell people, yeah, we need to, um, we need to get out the vote white folks. We need to get out, we really need to get out the vote. What are we voting on? Well, did you know the postmaster's black? That, that's not like a rallying cry for voter excitement, right? You need something more than that. You need to say things about like, well, I'm not, I won't say what else I can say. But you need a better rallying cry than that. So what do they choose? Let's keep this in mind. Josephus Daniels, Fertifold Simmons, they're planning an action 
They know they're going to suppress the black vote for the election on November 8, 1898, but they don't know what's going to come after that. But they know something is going to come after that. If they only had something that would rally white men to act against black men in power, if there was only something that would just fall into their laps, In the fall of 1897, this woman, her name's Rebecca Latimer Felton, she was the wife. Crusade against sin, nor justice in the courthouse to promptly punish crime, nor manhood enough in the nation to put a sheltering arm about innocence and virtue. If it needs lynching to protect woman's dearest possession from the ravening human beast, then I say lynch a thousand times a week if necessary. So, meanwhile, in Wilmington, this man, Alexander Manley, who was a man of color, he published the Daily Record, which was the only daily black newspaper in the state. Manly, this eventually, uh, a year later, made its way to Alexander Manley. Let's keep in mind that we don't have the internet in 1898. And Manly decides to write his own editorial in the Daily Record in response. And he writes, a Miss Felton from Georgia makes a speech in which she advocates lynching as an extreme measure. This woman makes a strong plea for womanhood that if the alleged crimes of rape were half so frequent as is oft times reported, her plea would be worthy of consideration. She loses sight of the basic principle of the religion of Christ in her plea for one class of people against another. If a missionary's spirit is essential for the uplifting of the poor white girls, why is it? The morals of the poor white people are on a par with their colored neighbors of like conditions, and if one doubts that statement, let him visit among them. The whole lump needs to be leavened by those who profess so much religion and showing them that the presence of virtue is an essential for the life of any people. Mrs. Felton begins well, for she admits that education will better protect the girls on the farm from the insulter. This we admit, and it should not be confined to the white any more than to the colored girls. The papers are filled often with reports of rapes of white women and the subsequent lynchings of the alleged rapists. The editors pour forth volumes of aspersions against all Negroes because of the few who may be guilty. If the papers and speakers of the other race would condemn the commission of the crime because it is a crime and not try to make it appear that the Negroes were the only criminals, they would find their strongest allies in the intelligent Negroes themselves. And together the whites and blacks would root the evil out of both races. We suggest that the whites guard their women more closely, as Mrs. Felton says, thus giving no opportunity for the human fiend, be he white or black. You leave your goods out of doors and then complain because they are taken away. Poor white men are careless in the matter of protecting their women, especially on the farms. They are careless of their conduct toward them. And our experience teaches us that the women of that race are not any more particular in the matter of clandestine meetings with colored men than are the white men with colored women. Meetings of this kind go on for some time until the woman's infatuation or the man's boldness bring attention to them, and the man is lynched for rape. Every Negro lynched is called a big, burly, black brute, when in fact, many of those who have thus been dealt with had white men for their fathers, and were not only black and burly, but were sufficiently attractive for white girls of culture and refinement to fall in love with them, as is very well known to all. Mrs. Felton must begin at the fountainhead if she wishes to purify the stream. Teach your men purity. Let virtue be something more than an excuse for them to intimidate and torture a helpless people. Tell your men that it is no worse for a black man to be intimate with a white woman than for the white man to be intimate with a colored woman. You set yourselves down as a lot of carping hypocrites, and you cry aloud for the virtue of your women while you seek to destroy the morality of ours. Don't ever think that your women will remain pure while you are debauching ours. You sow the seed, the harvest will come in due time. So that was published in August. 
August 18, 1898. They waited two months. They waited two months in Wilmington to do anything about that editorial. Why did they wait two months to do anything about that editorial? Because it was never about that editorial. The, the response for white men to take to the streets and do what they eventually did in Wilmington, it was never about that editorial. On November 8th, which is the election day, it was intense voter suppression to keep black men from the polls. Ballots were robbed, ballot boxes were stuffed. On November 9th, after an anti-fusionist ticket had been elected and would be sworn in next year, a white declaration of independence was authored and published on November 9th, making demands that black leaders leave the city, that fusionist party members leave the city, and all of this was done under the threat of death. November 10th, the day dawned, and not all of those conditions had been met, and even if they had, it wouldn't have mattered. An armed white mob with red shirts with a Gatlin gun on the back of a horse, all of the men armed, hundreds of people, went to the Daily Record, went to Alexander Manley's newspaper, and they burned it to the ground, and they didn't stop there. As few as 15, by some estimates, and as many as 60 black men were shot dead in the streets that day. Um, viciously murdered and left in the streets. Black families fled to the swamps and stayed for days. They fled their homes, they fled their businesses. Many hopped on trains and never returned to Wilmington. Wilmington began that day as a majority black city. It never was again. Never was again after that day because of the enormous exodus of people leaving town under threat of violence. So what happens after that? Well, a new government is installed. On November 10th, on that evening and the next day, they kicked out the duly elected government and they installed a complete white supremacist ticket. They literally overthrew the city. It's the only successful coup d'etat in American history. What happened after that? They were able to control government. They passed the poll tax. You had to pay to vote. They passed the literacy test. You had to read to vote. In some states, in North Carolina, they tried to. In some states, like South Carolina, Mississippi, Louisiana, they passed uh, the grandfather clause that said, if you were a free man in 1867, you could vote. Or if your grandfather or your father were free men in 1867, you could vote. Because that was better than trying to get poor whites to read. And sometimes poor whites couldn't afford to pay the poll tax. So let's go with the grandfather clause. They excised the black vote with the phrase that's become very popular here in North Carolina, surgical precision. So Chestnut is watching all of this. And here's what happens. The story of the race massacre in Wilmington becomes the story of the race riot. This is the cover of Collier's Magazine with the story written, written by the white supremacist mayor, Alfred Waddell, who led the violence and installed himself as mayor two days later. He sent this story to Collier's Weekly, which is like sending it to Google. And look at the picture on the cover. It's black men with guns and a white man lying dead in the street. They recast this from the very moment of its ending as a race riot. And for 100 years, that's what we would call it. It was a, it was a riot led by angry black men. They took to the streets and armed white citizens had to put down the riot. They had to save the day. But Chestnut is watching all of this. Chestnut is watching all of this. This is Chestnut about the time of, of the 1898 massacre, and I'm coming up here on the end. I'm going to do my best not to keep you more than an hour. But Chestnut is watching all of this. In a letter to Walter Hines Page, he writes, November 11th, the day after the violence, it reaches him in Cleveland because he has family in Wilmington. His uncle, Dallas Chestnut, his father's brother, was a postal worker, which was a great job. He was a, a railroad postal worker. He had a lot of family in Wilmington. He writes, I am deeply concerned and very much depressed at the condition of affairs in North Carolina during the recent campaign. I have been for a long time praising the state for its superior fairness and liberality in the treatment of race questions, but I find myself obliged to revise some of my judgments. There is absolutely no excuse for the state of things there. 
for the state has a very large white majority. It is an outbreak of pure, malignant, and altogether indefensible race prejudice, which makes me feel personally humiliated and ashamed for the country and the state. So how does Chestnut respond? He's a writer, right? He wants to write for this high, holy purpose. So he can elevate not black readers or black citizens, but white readers and white citizens. What does he do? Well, like all good writers, he goes on book tour. <laughs> this is an insert printed in the Wilmington newspaper. This is from February, I think it's February 10th, uh, 1900. Charles Chestnut, colored, a native of this state, now residing in the West, who has written several stories that were favorably received by the public and the book reviewers, notably The Conjure Woman and The Wife of His Youth, the scene of both being the town of Fayetteville, will give a reading from his own works in the city at Christ God Congregational Church next Thursday night. So Chestnut goes on a book tour. What is he doing on that book tour? He goes to Wilmington and he says, I'm just going to stop through here and do a little reading. And I'm going on my way to Tuskegee to meet Booker T. Washington. But we also know he did other stuff. He stopped in, Chesna, in, uh, in Wilmington in 1898 and he interviewed people. He interviewed his first cousins who were girls living in Wilmington in 1898. The Chestnut family was unharmed, but underwent some harrowing experiences. Their brother, Tommy, was Alexander Manley's assistant in the printing press. He helped to hide some of the printing equipment used for producing the Wilmington record, the target of the mob. One of the cousins remembered fleeing from school with her classmates to her teacher's home. She saw white men carrying guns and marching, stretched sidewalk to sidewalk. When one of the men said, let's throw a bomb in the N-word school, the children fled to the home of their white teacher. Chestnut's uncle Dallas, his father's brother, was one of the men who were able to get through the blockade amidst much shooting during the night of the riot. Chestnut's not down there on a book to work. Chestnut's down there doing research. Chestnut's down there doing firsthand research in the wake of this violent upheaval. Because what is he doing? He's trying to fulfill his high, holy purpose. In a letter from 1900, he writes to someone, I think you understand how difficult it is to write race problem books so that white people will read them. And it is white people they are primarily aimed at. Mine are doing as well as I could be expected. I shall write at least one more along the way, the same general line, but of a broader scope, attempting to sketch in vivid, those simple lines, the whole race situation. And he later writes, he's working on the mirror of tradition. If the mayor of tradition can become lodged in the popular mind as the legitimate successor of Uncle Tom's Cabin, as depicting an epic in our national history, it will make the fortune of the book and incidentally of the author, which would be very gratifying. Chestnut sets out to write in fiction the true story of 1898, the true story of the race massacre. And what he writes in 1898 is very clear. It was never about Alexander Manley. It was never about that printing press. It was never about that editorial. It was about secret meetings of white supremacists to overthrow the government. Chestnut knew in 1901 what it took many of us 100 years to realize while searching through the historical record. This book won the Pulitzer Prize in 2021. It came out 120 years after the mayor of tradition. So why don't we know about Chestnut? Because we're afraid of Charles Chestnut. That's why we don't know Charles Chestnut. When the book came out, it sold poorly. The Mayor of Tradition came out in the fall of 1901, three years after the race massacre in Wilmington. He was able to write that book. He writes his publisher, how is the Mayor of Tradition doing? Is it moving along with any degree of satisfaction? And if not, how seriously are you disappointed in it? I'm beginning to suspect that the public as a rule does not care for books in which the principal characters are colored people or with a striking sympathy with that race as contrasted with the white race. My friend, Mr. Howells, William Dean Howells, who has said many nice things about my writings, 
Although his review of the Marrow of Tradition and the North American Review for December was not a favorable one. Let's keep in mind that William Dean Howells was the father of American realism. When he reviewed Chestnut's book, he wrote, the book is in fact bitter, bitter. So when Chestnut told the true story through fiction, it was bitter. It was too realistic. It wasn't tales of plantations. It wasn't Uncle Julius or Uncle Remus or talking animals. It was a white supremacist campaign. It was death and violence and lost homes and generational wealth and lost businesses and people who left home and never, ever returned. And it was bitter, bitter. Chestnut would publish very sparingly over the rest of his life. He died in 1932. He published a novel in 1905 called The Colonel's Dream about convict labor, um, which was something flying under the radar nationally. It's where black men were arrested on trumped up charges and then loaned out to businesses to work on plantations and to build railroads like the one we have here in Western North Carolina. That entire railroad system was built by convict labor. Um, but he never reached the heights that he had reached before the mayor of tradition. And you have to think that Howell's reviews a bitter, bitter, of the poor sales of a book that told the truth too much have something to do with that. Um, but before he died, he won the Springer Medal from the NAACP. And he did write with a high, holy purpose, but he never reached the heights that I think he deserved. And I think certainly the heights that he could have reached had people read his book. Thank you all so much. I'd love to take questions if anybody has any questions or thoughts. Thank you. Is bitter. No, I wouldn't say so. Um, the, the book borrowed from a lot of the popular tropes at the time. There are twins who don't know they're related in the novel. There is a purloined letter in the book. It's a lot of the stuff that Chestnut was doing, purposely putting in these commercial aspects because he was convinced this novel is going to be my bestseller. This is going to let me quit stenography full time. So no, I don't think it was bitter. I think it was actually quite the opposite. Um, during the black arts movement, a lot of writers uh, really turned against Chestnut because of how he portrayed black characters. They, especially in the Marrow tradition. Um, he has a black revolutionary in the novel named Josh Green who, who dies. He has a, a woman named Mamie Jane who, who by no fault of her own, is killed during the, the race massacre. So he's not kind to his black characters. I mean, they don't save the day. Um, so I would not call the, no the novel bitter. I would call it realistic. I, I would say you could read it side by side with Sakino's book. Um, it, is, it, is it romantic a little and maybe a little melodramatic uh, due to the time in which it was written? Sure, sure. But no, I would not, I would not call it bitter. Yeah, wait for us to give you a mic so that we can um, let the live streamers hear you. Thank you. Was the book buying public aware that Chestnut was a black man? And you know, um, and in general, were they aware if the writers of whatever was being published were black or white? That's a great question. Not early on. He hit his race early on. He first began publishing stories. He did not disclose his race because it was assumed that writers writing in dialect would be white writers like Mark Twain, Joel Chandler Harris, and so he did not disclose his race at first. But by the time, certainly after Conjure Woman was published, people who knew the name Charles Chestnut would know he identified as a black man. So when Marrow Tradition was released, they would have certainly known that he was a black man. And it wasn't uncommon just like now to have the author's photo appear somewhere, somewhere in the book. But yes, he didn't disclose that at the beginning. He, he saw that as a barrier to getting into publishing. Julia. He, thank you. Um, he does look 
very white. What do we know about his parents? His grandfather was, I think his grandfather on his mother's side was a white man. And then his parents were light skinned. And so he, he chose to identify as white. He probably could have passed. Um, he did something that was, he married a woman whose skin was darker than his. Susan Perry's skin was considerably darker than his. And that was, that went against the grain uh, at the time, to be honest. That was an uncommon thing for someone like Charles Chestnut to do because there's a, there's a rush toward whiteness. It's turn of the century. We do have, in the early years of the 20th century, a rising black middle class, and we, we do have the, the advent of skin bleachers and hair straighteners, and so there is a move toward whiteness. So Chestnut was, like, what's going against the grain with some of the decisions he made. Was Chestnut ever targeted with violence by white supremacists? That I don't know. That I don't know. I would love to know that. Um, and I, I, I think his papers are at Fisk University in, in Nashville, Tennessee. And I would like to get over there one day and find out that very thing. I would like to know specifically what he did in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. I, I find that absolutely fascinating that he came to the city under the guise of a book tour. Um, and read from the wife. He read the story of the wife of his youth from that collection. But I would love to know what he did. Because his, his, his family was connected. As I said, his uncle was, was a postal worker, a railroad postal worker. And so they were part of that black middle class. And so they would have known. They would have known people. And that's what was so stunning about the massacre is that you were looking in the eyes of people you've known your whole life as they were shooting you or demanding you leave your home now. You have to leave. And, you know, my question is, what happened to that wealth? What happened to those businesses? What happened to those homes? That's, that's, that's the American dream. That's the nest egg of building wealth. And so many generations of people just, just have, have nothing after that. And many American commercial dreams started that way by taking somebody else's wealth. Uh, but a question. Um, he was so successful in the beginning with his uncle Julius character and the model of, of kind of sneaking in a message. Had he considered doing that for this particular event at all? Uh, do, doing a book of that nature, knowing, being a very intelligent guy, that, that something straight up frontal isn't probably going to succeed? I yeah, I think that he had reached a point in his career, and I think he kind of saw the writing on the wall with the dialect stuff. I think he saw that a lot of white readers aren't getting what I'm doing. And they're seeing Uncle Julius in the same ways they saw Uncle Remus. And he watched a career by someone like Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was from Dayton, Ohio, who was the, uh, the valedictorian of his class, in the same class that one of the Wright brothers was in. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was the valedictorian, a black poet from, from Dayton, Ohio. And Paul Lawrence Dunbar wrote dialect poems because Howell said, this is how you get in magazines. And he spent his life doing that, and Dunbar ended up very bitter at William Dean Howells for that, that advice and that direction that you have to fit into this box. And I think Chestnut learned when he stepped out of that box, his writing suddenly became very bitter to Howells and to the, to the reading public, to those who actually read the book. Um, I'm going to have a hard time articulating this, so bear with me. So you said you took uh, a course on North Carolina 20 years ago, whatever. Had that been taught for a while? Sort of when did it become acceptable to teach that? And sort of the whole thing about when did it become acceptable to sort of start telling the story about the massacre yeah. versus the race riot? That's a great question. In North Carolina, and then also in North Carolina, is there, when was the turning point? And then, um, how does the city of Wilmington embrace this or not today? Slowly, slowly. Well, I can tell you my wife went to high school in Wilmington and didn't learn a word about the race massacre until she went to college and studied under a black professor. And Sally Ann Ferguson was a black professor and taught me. She had a professor named uh, Earl Sheridan at UNC Wilmington, a historian. Um, so William Andrews, a researcher at Chapel Hill, I think he's retired, uh, wrote a literary, a literary biography of Chestnut that was published in the 1970s. And that, I don't want to say reinvigorated, it created Chestnut Studies. 
And so people began reading Chestnut very closely. And Sally Ann Ferguson came in the wake of Bill Andrews' big, big, big book. And so Wilmington began to come to terms with the massacre in the early 2000s. I think the state's report of 1898, excuse me, was released in 2003. I think that's right. Um, it was the official report um, wow. to account for what had happened. Um, and then I think in 2006, the News and Observer reprinted. You can find the report online. There's a link to it on the Common Word website, which is just unca.edu slash Common Word. There's an interactive map of violence during, on the day in 1898. There's a timeline. I got all kinds of stuff there. Um, but Wilmington is slowly coming to terms with it. Um, events here and there. There was a monument put up near the site of, of where the, shot, the original shots were fired in, in, in a neighborhood called Brooklyn. Um, there are art events often. There are days of remembrance. Every year there's an there's a 1898 uh, day uh, where they, on November 10th where there's um, honorings and memorials and things like that. So it lives a little bit larger than it did. Several years ago, um, my friend John Jeremiah Sullivan hosted Rhiannon Giddens, and uh, they did an event at Thalian Hall, which is interesting because that's where they were meet, the white supremacists were meeting to deliver the white statement of independence. But Thalian Hall is an antebellum theater in downtown Wilmington. Um, but Rhiannon Giddens came and they did a, a presentation performance where Rhiannon sang the music of 1898, the songs that would have been popular um, that happened. Uh, that, that were going on in 1898. And one of the songs that she performed was It's a Hot One in the Old Town Tonight because that was the headline that accompanied one of the stories on what happened in Wilmington. It was a hot one in the Old Town Tonight when the white men had to put down the black insurrection. Mm. Yes? <laughs> I have two very distinct questions. One, one which just came to me was uh, I'd be interested in just a little bit of information about uh, Governor Russell. I, I saw the little piece on the screen yeah. that he hid out in a, in a train car in order to escape that, which is interesting. Um, so I'll ask that question, but I do have a second one. Governor Russell was absolutely terrified. Um, in the months before the massacre, there was a huge white supremacist rally in Raleigh where they, 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 they made bonfires on the streets, they hung streamers, bands played, um, like hey, 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 ho, ho, Negro rule must go. They chanted for, for Governor Russell to come out of the governor's mansion. He was absolutely terrified. And he did not call on the National Guard because he was afraid of repercussions. Um, he was literally afraid for his life. So he was voted out of office very quickly when the, when the government took over, when the government was turned over. Was he at all sympathetic with what was I think to a certain degree. I mean, you know, there was still, uh, you know, even, even though the fusionist government bonded uh, poor whites and, and, and free people of color and formerly enslaved people, there was still a bit of grifting going on in the fusionist party. And I don't think it would be incorrect to say that Governor Russell was part of that grifting. He was part of that grifting. <coughs> he was part of that, um, you know, goes to the black church the day before the election and doesn't go back all year kind of politician. Um, so that, 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 that would be my, my feeling about him. Uh, uh, David Zucchino talks quite a bit about Governor Russell in the book. I'll be interested in that. My other very different question was, so Chestnut's one of those names that I could recognize and say, oh, black author, end of 19th, early 20th century, end of knowledge about Charles Chestnut. And so I'm quite fascinated that he wrote about you know, the problem of race is a white problem. Mm -hmm. And so I will be devoting my life and writing to helping white people understand how race is their problem. And I'm wondering what kind of community there was amongst black intellectual black writers uh, who shared that same desire? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that anyone as outspoken as him. I mean, the great polarities turn of the 20th century of Booker T. Washington and W. E. B. Du Bois. W. E. B. Du Bois believes in the talented tenth, tenth of black Americans right now are ready to seize the reins of power and art and culture and politics. 
And then Booker T. Washington is the slow, learn and trade, one foot in front of the other. Chestnut probably vacillated somewhere in between the two, to be quite honest. Um, he was a realist, both in his writing and in his operating and daily life. So I imagine he operated somewhere, somewhere in the middle. But I don't know necessarily who his colleagues were in the black writing community. Um, I don't know that he and Paul Lawrence Dunbar were close. I don't know that they ever met. Um, I would be curious to know about that. I know he and Mark Twain met. Um, but I don't know. And I don't know that either of those great educators was thinking about Not in the way educating was. the white community. Yeah, he was really ahead of his time. I mean, that's, that's not an uncommon track post the summer of George Floyd. Chestnut was doing that in 1880. Um, a couple of years ago here at UNCA, I was teaching a creative writing workshop, and before the workshop, one of my students said, who do you think the smartest writer in American history is? And I said, Charles Chestnut, hands down. They had the smartest, the smoothest operator, the most forward-looking. He predicted with, with the marrow of tradition, he saw essentially that what was coming for America was not race division necessarily, but that white supremacists were going to operate along class lines to agitate lower class whites. And he recognized that at the turn of the century, which I don't know that we fully recognize that now, but he recognized that this is not about race. Yes. This is about power and money. Use the word caste. Sure, yes, absolutely. He used the word caste. Hi again. Sure. Okay. I got the microphone. Um, so I did enjoy your book, When Ghosts Come Home. Oh, and I know you touch on sort of the white black um, race relations. And I'm just, I'm, I'm also impressed that Chestnut wanted to educate this sort of thing. But it seems like the people that are gravitating to white supremacy are trying to educate themselves through okay. literature. Sure. Yeah. And, um, you know, just, just the repeated, just listen to Rachel Maddow's Ultra podcast. And I guess during the, you know, World War II, there was another wave of this, and it seems like there's another wave. So as an author who writes about these things, I mean, what can be done to yeah. educate and raise the consciousness? No, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there are no easy answers to these things, but I think that the writer's goal and what Chestnut might say too, if I may be so bold, is that you just have to present not the world that you want it to be, you present the world that is when you're a realist writer, and that's sort of what I hold myself out to be. You present the world as it is, and let, let the people's the reader's judgment kind of fall where it may. Um, I try not to be didactic in my writing where I'm preaching to the, the reader. I hope that everybody, whatever your political or cultural stripe, you can read my book and my books and take something from it. Um, but yeah, just hoping that people see the humanity in all of the characters, which is what Chestnut was trying to do. Yes, sir. I thought it was very interesting when you gave his quote of the higher hope of who he was really trying to educate, the white people. So when I read The Mirror of Tradition, and I'm the white person thinking I'm going to learn something, but just like Mark Twain had Jim, so you always know when Jim spoke and he told the story. I found that in Mirror of Tradition, you had so much apostrophes and of that stylistic type. You couldn't follow the story, and that you could, he had all the different names of the town and places. It was nowhere near Wilmington anymore. Yeah. So you even thought, it doesn't mean anything. So I was thinking, the publisher, would he have known, hey, how can I attract the white audience sure. to understand it? I couldn't understand it. Well, we got to remember that dialect tales were really in vogue. So if we read Mark Twain, he's writing dialect tales with the same dropped Gs and the same apostrophes and the way Chestnut's doing. Those are conventions of 19th century literature that readers would have been conditioned to move through like butter. They hang us up. We can't. We get hung up on it. But a 19th century reader would have gone to the page for the specific reason of engaging with that literature. Because it's revealing to them how people speak that they've never heard before. 
So what what we when I re I have a class read one of the conjure tales, they're like, oh my god, this took so long to read. I'm like a hundred years ago, people were waiting for this to come out so they could read it because they don't have the internet, they don't have radio, they don't have television, they don't have any idea what folks in Louisiana or North Carolina speak like. So the things that repel us about Charles Chestnut's writing now, the, the, the dialect stuff, is the reason people would read it in the turn of the century. But even for the people of, say, lower education, <laughs> who could hardly read and write, sure. to start with yeah. the, the, the classic literature, and then you tried to read this, it would make no Yes, sir. Here, do it. So I'm um, <clears throat> trying to figure out how, from 1898, um, that this story was not in the national consciousness. I'm um, thinking of the 60s, and I'm thinking of Selma and Little Rock and Memphis, and uh, the national attention of your you know, that took place. And what is it about, you know, Wilmington made the South writ large? at this time that it didn't become a focal point? I think the easiest answer is the lack of media narrative, the lack of accurate media narrative. This, this was so planned that reporters were on the ground. They knew the vote was gonna be suppressed, the Washington Post was there, Collier's was there. There, were na there was national media in Wilmington because they knew the vote was gonna be suppressed on the 8th. But then after the coup happened on the 10th, some of that media was gone. But then the narrative is controlled so quickly. When we saw the mayor with the official story for Collier's, the mayor led the coup, the mayor led, led the race massacre. So the person who owns the historical narrative owns history. And we don't have television, we don't have the internet, we have newspapers, magazines. And if we think about, you know, one of the most famous moments of the Civil Rights Movement is George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door, because we've got photos of that. We've got photos of these young people walking to school being taunted, and the, or, or Emmett Till in, in, in Life Magazine. I mean, how impactful media is when it reveals truth through photography, or, or narrative, or, or factual reporting, and that's not what happened in 1898. For years, it was a, it was a race riot that had to be put down. And, and, and it's amazing the legs that that narrative had. Y'all been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I hope you come back here. Professor Bigney, the story you can give is a